We're going to do something a little bit, uh, uh, kind of a little bit more what we what we normally do on a Sunday morning. We're going to dive into a book of the of the Bible, uh, and we're going to go just verse by verse through it. But before we dive into it, I, anybody anybody know what this stuff is? Can you see it? Can you tell? What did you say? It was mail. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I actually raided uh, the missions uh, box here this morning. And so inside of the missions newsletter box, uh, the missions mailbox, we've sorted, we've pre-sorted all the junk mail out, and then Mindy does a good job of sorting it and getting it to the right place. Now, if I was to go to the actual mailbox, which I don't, even at my own house, I don't go to the mailbox. My wife's like, why didn't you check the mail? I don't, most of the time, I don't want what's in there. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, I mean, we've got letters from ARM, one of our missions. We've got letters from CSF. Uh, we've got letters from a Crossroads International, Greg Swinney. Um, we've got our mission of the month here. Uh, this month, we've got uh, For God's Children's International. This one's kind of curious. I did not open this yet, and it piques my interest. It's handwritten, but there's no return address. Mm. So I know somebody went through the effort to handwrite something there, but I'm not exactly sure who it is. So maybe, Ed, did you open this already? Did you? Okay, so there's some mail in your inbox. Now, if you can't think about anything else this morning, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give you this one right now. That way, when you get bored, uh, you can tell me who it's from later. Anyway, there's, there's a bunch of things in here, people I know, handwritten notes. I had an envelope on my desk here that I got months ago, and again, it's just a handwritten envelope. Somebody wrote out my name at the top of this letter. Uh, I've kept it there on my desk from time to time. Uh, that serves as a reminder for me just to give thanks to God for that person, to pray for that person. Uh, it served as a good reminder. Now, most of these letters mean something to me, and so I wanted to read the contents of it. I wanted to stay uh, informed about what that letter was trying to communicate to me. There are other pieces of mail, however. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's guilty of this. I don't know who it's from, or I find out who it's from, and the address, like the two section says, or current resident. Those are pieces of mail that you're like, oh, yeah, I want to read that one because <laughs> they just deeply care about me and wanted to communicate with me personally because it said or current resident. So today I use this just as an analogy or as a, a peaking of our interest. Today we're going to start a journey into a letter of the Bible. And we call them books of the Bible because, well, they're a little bit longer than maybe what we would consider a standard letter or form of writing today, and it's part of a larger book, a part of a larger collection that we call the book of the Bible. And we're going to touch just a little bit on how we got that, and I'm not going to be able to go very, very deep at all, because I really want to give just a setup for the book of Romans. It's already on your screen there. Um, and so when we look at this uh, book or this letter, this was written by a guy by the name of Paul. And Paul was one of these extremely influential men of the church, uh, of culture. Uh, he had done a number of travelings. People had heard about Paul. <laughs> and so this letter that we're about to read in the very first century was like this piece of mail that people wanted to read. They wanted to know, what does Paul have to say to us? And I think it's valuable for us today because Paul is going to teach us in the book of Romans a number of things that are going to be valued for life, eternity. And it's something that I pray your viewpoint is also, man, I can't wait to read this letter. Hopefully that's the case with every one of the books of the Bible or the letters written within the scriptures, uh, but especially this morning as we start this journey, it's like, I want to read this letter. What is it saying? What do I need to know? What is the author going to communicate to me? And so we see in, in chapter 1, verse 1, 
uh, right there. If you open up your scriptures, whatever version you have or form you have, you can open up to that. I promise we're not going to get very far today, just to let you know. We're not going to get very far today into the text, but we are going to learn that in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul. So that tells us who is writing. And then he starts to give himself a little bit of a description. It says, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, that right there is already a good amount of study that we're not going to be able to touch on in very much depth. So I want to encourage you, use this as a platform to take it deeper. There are lots of resources out there if you want to have conversations with me or study further about some of these things that we don't touch on as we move through this book. Feel free, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll go through that. But Paul is, uh, we find his early accounts in the book of Acts. And so to understand Paul's life, we really go to the book called Acts, which is a written rec. Uh, written record that Luke accounts of that early church happenings and a lot of what happens within Paul's life as he traveled around the known world there in, in a tight circle, and then he expanded that circle a little bit bigger, and then it got a little bit bigger to uh, and revisit some of the churches. But Paul was a man who we also know of as Saul, not the king way back in the Old Testament, but uh, Paul, born Saul of Tarsus. Uh, if you have a map you can see today that it's in the modern-day Turkey. That's the kind of the region. The exact date of his birth is unknown, but it is likely he is a contemporary within the same decade, at least, of Christ Jesus. He was a man who was schooled as a Pharisee underneath the Jerusalem uh, religious order of Gamaliel. So he was a up-and-coming uh, who's who... Like, I don't know if they still print these books of who's who's of, you know, high school or college students or whatever you see in magazines, who's who's of America's people or whatever. Paul was at the top of this list. He was on the cover of every GQ ma magazine you could find only for his smarts and other things. So he was, he was known as a Pharisee, uh, extremely uh, knowledgeable. He, however, became a traveling missionary. And he began to be the early, one of the first missionaries and preachers for the early church. It was, we know that he was renamed Paul. Uh, he also had a tent-making business. So at times he was, most times he was bivocational. And for, that's a church term we use. It means he also worked specifically in mission work or church work, but he also had another job. So bivocational. Um, he was imprisoned multiple times by the Roman government, by the authorities there, um, mainly because he made them mad. He just was kind of a burr underneath their saddle, and they didn't like it, and so they're like, we're going to throw you in jail. He wrote a number of, in fact, most of our New Testament letters are written by Paul, uh, attributed to him, and it is believed that he died somewhere around 62 to 64 uh, AD, uh, possibly martyred in Rome. There's uh, some information historically that leads us to that point. But we see that Paul, that's a, a kind of a brief summary. I want to dive a little bit into that in Acts uh, chapter 8 here, 7 and then 8, just a little bit. So if you want to turn there, you can. We'll be there in a little bit. But Paul states first that he is a servant. Uh, the Greek word there is doulos. Not that that matters that you can spell it or even say it. It just simply means servant. And we see that word throughout scripture a number of different places. It's equated to us as, as members of the body of Christ. We are doulosses. We are servants. Uh, just like Paul was a servant, we are called to that same life. Servant. So I just want to challenge you with that. Maybe that should be uh, one of the sub points you take away here. Paul, a servant, do we define ourselves this week, spend some time, where am I serving? What is, could it be said of me that I, if I was to write a letter to someone, like Paul wrote a letter and say, I, Doug, a servant, would that be recognized as actual, as factual uh, in, in my life? You do that for yourself and then um, see where the Lord takes you with that. But he says, he's a servant. And then he moves on and he says, but also an apostle, set apart for the purpose of the gospel. Now, the term apostle refers specifically to an individual who had firsthand experiences or received instruction by Christ himself. 
The disciples fall underneath that category because they traveled with Jesus. They experienced his teachings firsthand. They were commissioned to carry forth God's plan, the gospel to the world. And so it's easy for us to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the other 12 apostles to say, okay, this title of apostle, that fits them because, well, they were there. Uh, they were with Christ in the upper room at, at, his, at his last appearing. They, they spent time with Christ walking in the dust of their rabbi. Uh, it, they're apostles. Paul, however, uh, some have questioned his uh, self-proclamation of being apostle because, well, while Paul was born the same era as Christ, they didn't walk in the same circles. In fact, because Paul was a Pharisee, he actually saw Christ as an enemy, he saw him as teaching Pharisee. In fact, uh, when we look in Acts chapter 7, uh, we see that Saul is standing there giving approval when Stephen is stoned for preaching that Christ is Messiah and the gospel message. Uh, because of Paul, or Saul at the time, <laughs> because of Saul, the early church scatters from Jerusalem because there's persecution that is breaking out against those who called upon the name of Christ, who recognized Christ as Messiah and Savior. This is all a result of Saul, or the guy we know as Paul. But Acts chapter 9 records for us the interaction that Saul had with God and with Christ. And there's some other places in the New Testament that give us insight into his rightful claim into being an apostle. And so in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, we see it's on his way. He's approaching Damascus. And it says, Suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Sometimes we say, who are you, Lord? And we just forget the comma in there. And I just, I wonder, it's like, who are you, Lord? <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So we have other people accounting to the actuality of this event. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So he has this encounter with Christ. Now, He's there in Damascus. There's a man by the name of Ananias that we learn in this account who is directed to go to Saul. He's like, you want me to go to the guy who wants to kill me? <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm, are you sure? <laughs> I mean, you and I would definitely fall into this category of where Ananias is. I'm like, I don't know, Jesus. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. So, uh, he goes, and it says that he's taught, he, he teaches him. In verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Now, so first and foremost, Saul, this religious, righteous leader who is like to the letter of the law, Israel is all. <laughs> His very first audience is to people who he loathes. <laughs> they, they are outside of God's holy chosen people. And I'm sure Saul is like, wait a second. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. So I'm, my people that I'm supposed to go to first are, are the Jews, my people. And and he will. He goes to and enters the temple courts when he travels on his missionary journeys. They always reject him. And so God knew and had planned for Saul to be a voice of hope and meaning to carry the gospel to the Gentiles, those who had re, uh, 
were outside of God's holy and chosen people at that time. So Ananias, it tells us in Acts chapter 9, that he goes to him and he lays his hands on Saul. Uh, The text tells us that scales fall from his eyes. He is baptized. He eats. And he receives strength. And in uh, verse 19, it says, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. I mean, this is a, a, just an, a, mir- a miracle of transformations. This is one of those acts that you're like, if God's going to show up, if God's going to do something, it's going to have to just be beyond our imagination of possibilities. It happens right here. Here's a man who's breathing out murderous threats, binding people because of their proclamation of Jesus as God, as Messiah, putting them to death. And here he is now proclaiming the very same message that he was persecuting others for sharing. Now, we learn just a little bit more about the life of Saul and his early on Uh, instructions and what happens. We see that in Galatians. This is a letter that Paul writes to the believers there in Galatians. So Galatians receives a a letter specifically from Paul, and this is what it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, "'For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. It's not made up, It's not my message, it's not Peter's message, it's not somebody else's message. This is God's message. He says in verse 12, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And oftentimes we recognize very clearly his speaking. We while we have a little bit of the message of Jesus saying, Hey, it's me you're persecuting, that is who's speaking to you. There may have been more, but that's all we have recorded there. But he goes on to explain that just a little bit further. It says um, in verse 13, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and, called, and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And so we see there that uh, Paul declares that God reveals to him uh, the message of Christ Jesus, who reveals Christ himself to him in order that he might be equipped to preach among the Gentiles. Now, at the end of Galatians chapter 1 and into chapter 2, we uh, see that Paul reveals that he was taught by Christ in Arabia. And then he compares notes with Peter and John after being uh, after 14 years of doing this. So Paul's over here doing his thing, Peter and the other apostles over here doing their thing, they finally, after 14 years, are able to share notes of what they were taught, and they're identical. They're the same. It says that they were found to be the same. And so Paul, by the other disciples, the other apostles, is accepted not only as a follower of the way or a follower of Christ, but as an apostle who was, in fact, set apart for the advancement of the gospel. And so what Romans tells us remains to be true. Paul, a servant and an apostle, set apart for the gospel, uh, is true. And that's what we're going to study. Romans is said to be an explanation of the gospel. Now, it's easy to get off in the weeds. It's easy to get lost sometimes. It's deemed as one of the most complex books of our New Testament in trying to understand. I remember in college thinking um, in English courses and then studying the book of Romans. I'm like, Paul was a terrible English student. 
with all of these run-on sentences, and it's just like a thought, and then another thought jumps in there. We don't complete that thought. The, the linear processes of the English language specifically, they're just not there. I think of really any language. It's, it's really sometimes hard to trace, and so you have to get back there. So that's why it's said to be understand, uh, hard to understand and sometimes unclear, but the God, the letter of Romans is rich and I believe is fully within our capacity to understand. And I think there's, uh, I know that to be true because the scriptures tell us that there are, this word of God is for us to understand. Now, a little bit about Rome here. Um, we see that the the letter of Rome, or Romans specifically, some wonder how this letter, how this group of disciples came to be, how the church came to be in Rome, because Paul hadn't made it there yet. Um, there's no evidence that we see necessarily of any of the other apostles from Jerusalem traveling all the way to Rome specifically. So how did it get there? Well, we don't necessarily have all of the connecting dots that trace that but it's not hard to, to understand or guess that Rome, as the central city of the empire, is the hub. Everything that happens within the Roman Empire underneath that time can find its tracings back to that city of Rome. And if persecution is breaking out against the church in Jerusalem, and people are fleeing their homes because this guy named Saul is arresting them and putting them in prison and executing them, it makes sense that as the disciples scattered from Jerusalem, they're going to find at least uh, through familial relationships, business entities and relationships, they're going to find their way to Rome because it is the central hub. So it makes sense to me anyway uh, just when I look at life and, the, and how people pattern themselves, that when, when the disciples scattered, when those who had received the message of the gospel scattered, it would eventually lead to uh, Rome. And so Paul would speak many times in the letters of, of wanting to visit Rome. Uh, we do see that eventually he does make it there uh, through maybe the ways that he didn't necessarily plan to, but he does uh, make it there. Um, but when we think about uh, the letter of Romans, also when we look at the scriptures, many times when I look at the mail, and I look at like specifically this handwritten note, um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to go around comparing writings. Like I'm not going to do a, a letter, what do you call that, where you compare the writing and handwriting skills? There's a term for that. Anybody know that? I didn't look that up. Script about scriptology or something? I don't know. I just made that up. Um, so that's not gospel truth. <laughs> There's that handwriting uh, comparison. Some of the letters in the New Testament and the books of the Bible as a whole have received a lot of scrutiny over the years. And some different levels of... Uh, well, I think maybe it's justified, but the 66 books of the Bible that we have, they've always tested and stood uh, the test of time and all the criteria there. When I look at a letter here, I know it's written by someone because they often sign their name. We see Paul does that. Um, the letter of Romans has, is one of the most highest, even those outside of religious circles acknowledge that the letter of Romans was actually written by Paul. At the time it was written, it is a legal document. <laughs> it, it is, uh, its authorship is verified. That's important. And, and I think just as a, as a side note here, when we look at our scriptures, the validity of scriptures for what we believe, for guiding our lives, I, I think that's important because if we look at something, a manual, to guide our steps and our directions, we want to know that that is true. Um, and so while we look at the scriptures like of the Old Testament and, and we try to study, well, are those books, how do we know that those books are true? Uh, we see over time, by the time of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, 
a character, a prophet, the Nehemiah, all of our early Old Testament scriptures were already accepted and utilized within the temple as inspired works of God, those books that we see there at that time. Um, and when we look uh, into further uh, into the New Testament, uh, we see there's a number of criteria that we use for a standard of what is scripture, what is inspired and what is not. Uh, there's a number of books out there that might seem like scripture and that we even ask, well, why aren't they scripture or why are they not? Um, you know, what makes our scriptures actually scripture inspired words of God? There was um, a number of different criteria that over the years has definitely been implemented all the times. And the, and the number one thing was, was the book written by the person that they say it's written by? So if it's written by a prophet, is, did that prophet actually write that? Or did they transcribe that to someone else? The letter of Romans meets that criteria easily and clearly. Uh, was the writer, uh, when they wrote stuff, was it authenticated by eyewitness accounts? Um, is there someone else that can confirm that this person actually spoke these things? Or if there was a miraculous encounter that took place that was recorded, did somebody else, can they confirm that? And, well, we have that with our scriptures. Uh, does the book tell about God, the truth of scripture, or does, is there some things within it that are falsehoods or they contradict other areas of scriptures that we've already made as criteria? Uh, does the book give evidence of the divine capacity to transform lives? Or was the book accepted um, as God's word by the people to whom it was first delivered? So these are the criteria. And, and while over history, there was a number of councils that met to verify and to scrutinize, yes, these scriptures are valid, authentic words of God. Really, a lot of what those councils did was already affirm what the previous generations had already come to know. And so unlike uh, pseudophigraphal works, which are uh, letters that someone wrote using somebody else's name, we have within um, the scriptures that we have actually accounts of someone who says, yes, I write this with my own hand or I transcribe this because someone else who is an apostle directed from the Lord spoke these things for me to write. Um, and so that's, that's important. If you want to know more about all that different pseudophigraphal and uh, different types of writing, we can have a conversation about that. But that gets long and kind of boring and sometimes. So Romans has a strong uh, foundation as the inspired word of God, and this is important. Uh, Romans chapter 16, we'll get to this at the very end, probably as kind of a side note, but it says, I, Tertitus, who wrote this letter, he was a person who was with uh, Paul, who was his scribe. Uh, he says, I greet you in the Lord. It's at the very end where he's saying, hey, I've got permission here to write this down. Ga Gaius, who is host to me, these are real people who Paul had relationships with. And to the whole church, we greet you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. These are all people that have been verified at some level to have a known association and role with Paul. And all of this is important because if we don't believe that the words we're reading are truth, well, then why obey it? Why submit to it? Because what we believe and what we read as our sources, it really makes a difference. If your doctor tells you, hey, you're going to have to stop eating all that fatty foods because you've got a heart issue, it makes a difference if you're, if you're, uh, if you're going to do that or not based upon who would tell you that. You want to know that your doctor said that, <laughs> or somebody who has knowledge of that, firsthand experience and the outcomes of that. For an example, I'm going to use a, it was a few years ago, we painted a, a little building, and I, my kids just wanted to paint, and we were using oil-based barn paint, red and white. And I told my kids, hey, don't touch it. <laughs> if you touch it, it'll get everywhere and it doesn't come off very easily. And so uh, based upon their level of either skill or acceptance of my instruction as truth, uh, I saw the outcome of that. <laughs> so we, we do this with our lives in every way, shape, or form. If, um, 
if we're, if we're told something and we understand and accept that to be a person who is speaking truth, it dictates our actions. And so when it comes to the letter of Romans, it's important for us to have that as a foundation to start with. Um, the word of God has a purpose. Second Timothy, this is a, a letter that Paul would write to his son in the faith. That's what he's titled there in the beginning of the scriptures, Timothy. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is the purpose of the inspired words of God, these 66 books of the Bible that we have. It's for profitable teaching, reproof, correction, and training. But this is not something new. Nehemiah would do this. In fact, I mentioned Nehemiah. Um, he was rebuilding the wall. Uh, we see in Nehemiah chapter 8. And, and sometimes we skip over this stuff and we miss it. But I want to read this account for us because it goes to the purpose of why we're studying what we study and why we gather as a church to study the scriptures. But it says in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1, it says, All the peoples gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women and those who can understand. And the ears of all the peoples were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood a list of names there. <laughs> I'll let you read through those. In verse 5 it says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord and great, uh, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then there's a whole other list of names. It says, They helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. It looks a lot like our church today, doesn't it? This is the purpose of why we gather. This is the purpose why we study the Word of God. This is why it's not just me who gets to teach. <laughs> we see a collection of godly men here who give support, who are also helping to explain the Scriptures, but it's not just for knowledge, it's so that that understanding can take and be applied. This is the purpose of Scripture. This is the purpose of gathering as the church. And so if you're curious about what the church studies, what, what we believe, we go back to the Scriptures, the inspired Word of God, and we teach it prayerfully in a way that can be understood. And, and if it, it's not understood, it's okay. Ask questions. Because the purpose of reading and studying the book is not just to say, yeah, I heard it. The purpose of reading the scriptures is so that we understand it. That's our goal as we go through this. And I pray that uh, this text here, understanding the life of Paul and how he was a servant and how he studied the scriptures, a student. I pray that that's a motivation for us to be a servant, to study the scriptures, to be like the people of Nehemiah's day, to gather together, uh, to worship. I mean, even do things like maybe we're uncomfortable with in worship, like what they just described of raising our hands, uh, of, of gathering together afterwards and, and studying in a little bit smaller group with the teacher saying, help, help me understand more clearly, more fully. Uh, Joining together in other studies, like at our Connect time, where we study the Word of God so that we understand, and then we can apply it to our lives. There's, there's so much here that we're going to explore, like God in heaven, the differences between the, the Jewish people and the Gentile people. We've done a little bit of that in Hebrews. 
as we studied that uh, letter, we're going to talk about eternity. We're going to talk about grace. We're going to talk about salvation, baptism, uh, so much more <laughs> as we study through this letter. And so I want to encourage you to make a commitment, if you can, to stay connected uh, each and every week uh, as we go through this letter. Even if it's not here, somehow online or studying uh, together through it, it's, it is a few chapters uh, where, we, where we get our breakdowns, the numbering system, where that came a little bit later, later in the letter. That goes to the, the whole makeup of Scripture. But continue to read it, understand it, and where we don't understand it, continue to ask questions, go through it, because it is rich and applicable for us. Now, if there's any questions about anything we've ever said uh, today, uh, if there's anything about the church body, and, and maybe we've talked about the gathering of the body for the purpose of studying, for the purpose of worship, and you kind of feel like maybe you're on the outside, or maybe you've been in attendance for a while, but you've never made a commitment to the local church here, we want to have question, We want to talk to you about what that looks like. Uh, we talked about our annual meeting and the purpose of, of giving insight and input into that. Um, those are for, that's for committed individuals. If you've never gone through that process to say, yeah, this is my church home, you will know that because we've had this conversation. We've talked about partnering with us. Uh, at some point in time, we have introduced you and embarrassed you completely before everyone else and said, hey, go ahead and stand up, you know, introduce or something. We, you've done that. If you've not done that, then we'll check things like that and, and go through that. Uh, but I don't know what your step is. Maybe it's just sharing with someone this week that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God. And it is truth. And it has value and guidance for everyday practical living. So whatever the issue is, let's go to the Scriptures and study it. Um, there's probably something here for you this week to be able to take and apply to your week and daily activities. Um, so take that step. Uh, I want to encourage you here. We're going to stand as we close in prayer. So you can stretch, get your feet underneath you. Whatever your step is, uh, I do want to make an invitation if there's something where you just want to spend time in prayer with someone, if there's a need uh, that you want to lift up before God in prayer with someone, uh, come down front and uh, we'll spend some time in prayer together. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Paul. Uh, thank you for the instruction that you've given us. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness throughout the generations to uphold your words. Uh, every time there's new evidences of uh, pieces of Scripture being found, it confirms that your word is true. It, it brings greater light into the reality that you have held together your words completely from the beginning of time. And uh, this word has a purpose, to guide us, to speak to us truth, so that we can take steps to build your kingdom proclaim the gospel. Father, help us to this end uh, this week. Bring us back together to gather and worship and encourage one another as the body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, church.